Okay, so this is the grand finale, uh, if you like, of uh, relativistic quantum mechanics, at least the part that we're considering in this course, before you're moving on to quantum field theory, standard model, uh, etc. Um, where, at least, finally, we're going to resolve some of the, the problems that we encountered in the one particle relativistic quantum mechanics. Let me submit the link once more in the chat there we go you can always just copy the one that is uh, in the video feed as well if you like um so let's recall what, what was the problem here um, in the example of the dirac equation that i've written so dirac equation for a spin one half particle psi with mass m and charge Q. So I've incorporated here also the interaction with the electromagnetic field just to display the, the charge. Um, so what are the, the solutions there? Well, interpreted as a one particle quantum mechanics, we noticed that it has both positive energy solutions. Um, so ones with energies larger than the rest mass MC squared, but also negative energy solutions. Now, in one of the exercises a couple of weeks ago, what you noticed is that, in fact, there is not so much difference between the solutions that have these negative energies and the ones that have the positive energies. In fact, a simple conjugation operation turns a, a negative energy solution into a positive energy solution. And so what does this uh, look like again? Uh, so this charge conjugation, psi going to psi sub c, um, which was using this gamma 2 matrix, and then the complex conjugate of the Dirac spinner. So it changed the energy into minus the energy, so a negative one into a positive one. It flipped the sign of the momentum. Um, well, of course, that's not changing uh, the, the, the characteristics of the particle, but importantly, it was changing the sign of the charge. And really, we like to interpret you know, this, these other types of solutions for the Dirac equation with opposite charge as corresponding to the antiparticles of the particle with charge Q. So, having opposite quantum numbers. Okay, so this was exercise 27. Um, and Dirac gave for us a possible interpretation in, in uh, for the Dirac equation, stemming from well, filling up all these uh, negative energy um, one particle eigenstates of the uh, Dirac equation as being like occupied by the Dirac C. And then really this antiparticle corresponding to a hole in this completely occupied uh, Dirac C. Now this works if you're just looking at a single particle or a single antiparticle, but well, there is still a clear asymmetry there. When, when it's treating you know, an antiparticle at the, as the absence of a particle, while really you know, the, the situation should be um, really symmetric between the particles and the antiparticles. And moreover, if we'd like to really deal with many particle systems, then this was also kind of an untenable situation, because well, why don't all these particles in the Dirac C actually interact with each other? So really what we would like is to you know, describe just positive energy particles as well as antiparticles in a unified manner. without uh, so unified manner 
without this reference to the Dirac C. And in order to do this, we're really going to take um, the lessons that we've learned in the case of the electromagnetic field and see how we can really systematically build up uh, the, the Fox space of these, these fermionic particles. So what are these lessons that we've learned? So let's just write them down and then go through them, uh, both for the Dirac field and the Klein-Gordon field. So the lessons based on the electromagnetic field, okay, the, uh, the, the general strategy that we can deduce from that. So it essentially has uh, six steps. So let's, let's number them and then I'll refer to them back in the uh, remainder of this lecture. So one up to six. So the first thing that really changed our perspective last, last time was that we do not want to you know, get our Hamiltonian from well, simply the time evolution dictated by the one particle quantum mechanics. We want to take the Hamiltonian from well, the classical energy that is stored in these fields. So really what we have to start with is determine the classical Hamiltonian for the uh, wave equations under consideration. So Maxwell in the case of the electromagnetic field. And there, well, we just recalled what this Hamiltonian was from the electromagnetism courses. As soon as we have this Hamiltonian, it's useful to plug in a plane wave expansion of the solutions to the wave equation. So we perform a plane wave expansion. And then in this Hamiltonian expressed in terms of the coefficients in the plane wave expansion, we hope to identify a set of harmonic oscillators. So identify, okay, this will be an infinite set of simple harmonic oscillators, which we know how to uh, quantize. So we take the uh, coefficients, so the Fourier coefficients, and we simply put hats on them. So we quantize the Fourier coefficients and they really become for us the creation and annihilation, annihilation operators of the many particle quantum mechanics. Um, well, as soon as we have this kind of set of formal operators, uh, we still need to kind of define what they do in the Hilbert space. And for this, we have to choose what their commutation relations are. So the next step is to choose wisely um, whether we're gonna impose uh, commutation or anti-commutation relations. And for the electromagnetic field, we notice that imposing commutation relations actually uh, works well and gives a Hamiltonian which is bounded below. So we'll use the same criterion here for Klein-Gordon and Dirac, uh, so just checking whether uh, choosing one set of relations over the other leads to the same uh, quantum theory. And then finally, once we have this, so we have a Fox space in place, we know what the energies are in terms of the, you know, the occupation numbers. We can also look at uh, other quantities like the total charge of the system. As, seen, as soon as we know how these depend on the number operators, we can actually just read off what the particle interpretation of our operators are. So this will be the last step.
that we already did for the electromagnetic field for the photons. So we're going to deduce the particle interpretation. And then essentially, okay, we're done. We have a flux space and we can interpret it. Of course, one can do lots more. One can then look at interactions with other systems, but that is really beyond the scope of these lectures. Um, let me add a small remark here. And that is that here we're purely looking at things from a Hamiltonian perspective. Um, later you will learn that actually it can be more systematic to view this from a Lagrangian perspective, like starting from an action. So parts of this can be done more systematically um, in the Lagrangian formalism. and especially using path integrals. So there, there are some shortcuts available. Um, but really, um, this you will encounter in the quantum field theory courses. Are there any questions here about the, the strategy that we're gonna take? Um, so since we'll be revisiting these steps a couple of times, it's actually useful to record them a bit. So I've actually put a list uh, here on the side. So then I don't have to repeat every time what the steps are. Um, and we're going to start with the Klein-Gordon equation. Since arguably that is the simplest and it's also... Um, in, in, the most analogous one to the electromagnetic uh, field equations because well, we're dealing with integer spin. Klein Gordon. So let's just write down the equation again. Klein Gordon equation. Um, and we're going to look at the single component uh, Klein-Gordon equation, right? So that means that at every space-time point, we just have a com complex value for the field. And we notice that this uh, describes spin zero particles. Um, and if you like, we can assign a charge to these particles. So let's assume these particles have charge Q. And just like if for the electromagnetic field, we can put it in a box. And let's choose the same type of box as uh, last time. So in a periodic box of dimensions uh, L, so uh, volume uh, V. So step one for us is to um, determine the Hamiltonian of the system. Now we're not going to derive this um, because so far we only really know an equation of motion of the system and you cannot actually derive a Hamiltonian directly from an equation of motion. Typically you would start with, uh, with a Lagrangian or an action and then you can actually derive the Hamiltonian. So let me just pose for you the, uh, the Hamiltonian uh, and okay, maybe you, this will convince you that it's the only kind of uh, correct Hamiltonian that one can write down. So really the, the energy density uh, in our system is of this form. So we have like a kinetic term including the time derivatives of the field, and then we have the spatial derivatives. Uh, 
and we have complex conjugates on one of them because certainly we want the energy to be a real number and then we have this mass term okay let me not put a dot to confuse you since these are just scalars um, so one kind of non-trivial check you could do to make to, to if you do not agree that this is Hamiltonian, it's just a check that its time derivative is actually uh, zero, so it's constant in time, if phi solves the klein gordian equation. If you like, you can also identify a time derivative of phi with you know, a momentum uh, on phase space and then check that the Hamilton equations defined by this Hamiltonian actually reproduce the uh, Klein Gordon equation. But let's not go there. Okay, so we have to look at the uh, plane wave uh, expansion. So, what were the plane wave solutions again that we derived in? Okay, I guess this was the, uh, the first uh, uh, lecture of this series. These are just the form, the four momentum uh, inner product with the four position in the exponential. If you plug this in the Klein Gordon equation, then it's satisfied if and only if the, well, the norm of the four potential is related to the mass of the particle, the m squared c squared. Um, and this is equivalent to saying that the energy of the particle, so the zero of component of the four momentum, is given by, let's write EP for the, you know, the, the, the classical um, dispersion relation. Okay, and then there is a, the, the, um, the, the, the speed of light to make the units right for P zero. But it was we could get both positive and negative solutions here, right? So EP is the standard relativistic dispersion relation. That we would like to see for our relativistic wave equations. Okay, so if these are the plane waves, then we can easily write down the corresponding uh, plane wave expansion simply by summing over the allowed spatial momenta. So the spatial momentum, well, it has to be such that the spatial dependence here um, is periodic with period L. So it should take values 2 pi over L times h bar because we also have an h bar there and then triples of integers let's put a conventional you know, dimensionful uh, quantity in front to make the rest dimensionless and let's split the dependence here on the, uh, the the four position in terms of the the spatial position and the time dependence. So the spatial position, it's uh, we'll define a Fourier, Fourier component in such a way that we have an orthogonality when we integrate it over this box. So the appropriate normalization is to take one over the square root of the volume and then e to the i p dot x, just the spatial parts of h bar. And then we have two contributions and let's just name these uh, contributions a p depending on t and c p depending on t where these are really some complex number a times you know, the, the positive frequency part so 
So this is positive frequency corresponding to the plus here. Um, but we also have to take into account the possibility where we have a minus. So this is the CP where we now have e to the i energy times time for h bar. So this is the negative frequency part. Okay. Um, so quick question here. Uh, so now we have two pairs of coefficients, AP and CP. So this is slightly different from the, the case last week. Let's do a quick question here. So in the electromagnetic case, the positive and ne negative frequency modes, they were related to each other. Um, so should that be the case here as well? So should I have written, uh, uh, instead of this C, like an A with a complex conjugate or something like this, Okay, let's see. So opinions are divided. Um, they're equally split between no and yes. So let's let's go back a bit in our minds to, to last time. So what did we do when we wrote the plane wave expansion for the, the electromagnetic field? Um, we had two terms there as well, right? For the, uh, uh, we had a sum over the wave number there instead of the momentum, but it comes down to the same thing. We had a sum over the two different polarizations. Sure, because that was a vector and here we just have a scalar. Um, so nothing really different in that respect. We had a dependence on uh, the position. Um, and we had a positive and ne negative frequency mode. But really, why did we put the negative frequency part equal to complex conjugate for the positive one? Well, because we wanted to make sure that this vector potential was a vector of real numbers, right? Um, if we had not made this identification, then we would have gotten complex numbers in the factor potential. But here, um, we have no such constraint. And we said from the outset that the field has to be uh, complex valued. Um, so that means that really all these different uh, plane wave solutions, they you know, have to um, uh, appear in the Fourier expansion to have the most general solution. So there is no relation between A and C. Um, and later we will see that this does not cause any uh, problems in the quantization, but it does cause a, a new feature to happen, which is exactly related to the fact that we're dealing with uh, charged particles. Um, so the correct answer was the first one. Uh, some people have uh, shifted already. Um, let's uh, turn back on our menu. Very good. So we have these two independent uh, coefficients. So really what we want to do is we want to uh, substitute the solution into our expression for the Hamiltonian and see what they are in terms of A and C. And really this is a, a simple calculation, simpler than the one that we did for the electromagnetic field uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I'm not going to do it explicitly, 
but you're going to see already roughly what is happening. If we substitute two of these in there, then the spatial dependence is all in these Fourier components, which are orthogonal once integrated over the spatial volume. <clears throat> so then we get both of these terms uh, together, um, and they will actually appear with different relative sign for the kinetic and spatial derivative terms, which cancels the cross terms between these two. And what one is left with is something very similar to the electromagnetic case, except that now we have both A and C, which both appear with their absolute value squared. So uh, remember that for the electromagnetic case, we had a sum over the wave numbers, sum over the polarizations, and then the energy h bar omega k, and then only the coefficient a k lambda squared. Um, so that's very sim similar, um, except that we now have like double copies. So each of these coefficients, both a and c, have harmonic oscillators associated to them. If we would write them in terms of their real and, and imaginary components, this would really look like a, for each choice of uh, the momentum, we have a harmonic oscillator for A and we have a harmonic oscillator for C. So we want to quantize these. Okay, so for A, well, let's do exactly the same thing that we did um, in the electromagnetic case. So we simply put a hat on it. And okay, this is in the Heisenberg picture. So the, these operators depend on time. They're related to the time independent versions uh, with an annihilation operator AP and then associated with a phase, this positive uh, frequency phase, energy times time over h bar. Um, but how about the other coefficients? What should we do with those? Well, we said that the CP, they are the negative frequency components. So we want to treat them not as the annihilation operators, but as some creation operators. Um, but we do not want to associate them to creation operators of the same particles as these A's, but to a different set of particles, which are going to be the antiparticles for the particles associated to A. So let's introduce a, another set of creation and annihilation operators that I'll denote by B. And because this is a negative frequency, we should associate to the C a B dagger. Um, and we can, since we're having a dagger here, we also have to you know, associate it not to the momentum P, but to the momentum minus P. Where now B P, uh, sorry, the time dependence is just like for the the A ones. So this is B hat P times. Right, so, so we'll see that they have similar qualities. Um, I think with related, you're asking about whether there are non-trivial commutation relations between these. 
A's and B's? Uh, well, the answer will be no. So we'll see that these are these are essentially completely disjoint, except for the important important fact that the A's and B's appear combined in the field. So they will be intimately related to each other. Um, so let's let's write this down. Uh, so what does the Klein Gordon field operator now look like? After the substitution, um, so we have simply the thing written above, but now uh, with hats on it. And then B hat dagger minus B. Um, and okay, just like in the electromagnetic case, we can also write this uh, in a slightly different way um, by changing here the sum over P to the sum over minus P, so just relabeling things, um, and then substituting the expression for this Fourier co coefficient here. So we get the volume appearing in the normalization. And then the, uh, the positive frequency modes now written in this covariant form uh, and negative frequency modes Where okay, so so this is a sum over the spatial momenta. So so what is this four momentum that I write here? So here by convention I say that the uh, four momentum p is given by the spatial momentum, and then the zero of component really being the positive energy, uh, the correct positive energy solution. So then it's clear from the time dependence that this is really a positive frequency one and this is really a negative frequency one. So what is the use of actually writing it in this way? Well, now we have all the time and space dependence in this single covariant form. Um, so it follows immediately that this full operator is still a solution to the Klein-Gordon equation because these are solutions to the Klein-Gordon equation. So manifestly, Uh, still solves the Klein-Gordon equation. Just like in the case of the, the quantized um, electromagnetic field, which still solves the Maxwell equations. Okay, next step on the list. Now we really have to specify uh, what are the appropriate um, commutation relations that these these operators should satisfy? Now, of course, we already have a clear expectation of what this should be, since these are spin zero particles, and we expect that spin zero particles have to correspond to bosons. But let's actually see where this identification comes from. And for this, we have to impose some uh, some criteria that we really like on this theory. And one of the criteria that we really like is having positive energies, or at least energies that are bounded from below. Um, so let's just check what this particular definition of the uh, Klein-Gordon field operator means for the, the energies of the system. So we're going to look at the Hamiltonian operator which we get from the classical Hamiltonian just by putting hats on the fields. So this amounts to the following. Let me write it down explicitly. Uh, 
right? Now again, there is the same exercise before. We have to substitute these. Well, it's better to substitute this first expression in here because we can again use the orthogonality of these Fourier modes. Um, so what you get if you work this out is, of course, it, it should be a quantization of this particular expression here. Um, but we, we'd like to see exactly what the order is of the um, creation and annihilation operators that we get in the quantization of these expressions. And the exact order that one gets is a dagger a for the a uh, operators. Well, for the b operators, we get a b b dagger. Now, as usual, okay, here I, these things are evaluated at minus the spatial momentum. But since we're summing over p, we can we can drop this and just think of it as b b p. Um, so we want to express this in terms of the, the number operators. And to get the number operators, I have to interchange uh, the orders of the B and the B dagger. Yes. Okay, yeah, let, let me be careful there. Yes. Yeah, so this is important. Um, right, so, so here really these are the four vectors because that's where the time dependence of this operator is stored in the exponential. Um, yeah, so, so, so it's good that you uh, notify me. So everywhere else uh, we should, these are really the, the spatial components of P. Let me be a bit more careful. Ah, uh, but this should also be a minus sign here. Oh, no, no, right. So here I switched from, from minus P to P in this step. Uh, P to minus P here, just for the, uh, the second term. Well, okay, so, so, so we should really do several uh, sub-steps here. Um, write this as two separate sums. Then in the second sum, I relabel P for minus, uh, minus uh, P prime, if you like. Then it will be, become a sum over P prime with this particular sum. And, and then I well change P prime label into P again and, and combine the, the sums again. And that will give us exactly this. Well, okay, so so I'm saying we, I'm doing the relabeling only when I've separated you know, these two terms into two separate sums. There, so then if I've gone from P to minus P prime, I'm summing over P prime, and I have a B sub P prime there. Then I say, okay, I, I can forget about the prime because this is just changing my the label on my integration, on my summation. And then I again have a sum over P for the A's, a sum over P for the B's, which I can combine in a single sum. So okay, I understand there are, there are a couple of mental steps in between, um, but this is actually important. So please you know, write this out for yourself in as much detail as, as you, you need, um, because 
well, we're doing this a couple of times implicitly. Like here, we're saying, ah, uh, this part of the sum, if I forget about the, the a's, um, it really does not matter where they have a p or a minus p here. So I can just drop the minus by exactly the same argument. Of course, using the fact that, that e sub p um, is the same as e sub minus p. We're slightly more used to doing this uh, if we had integrals here. Right? So then we here we're doing an integral over p of something. And then you would just think of this as uh, you know, uh, changing your 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 integration. Um, variable, um, which you're doing all the time. Now here we're just changing our summation variable. This comes down to the same thing. Um, okay, so now what we'd like to see is that what we get after we interchange the order of these operators is something that is bounded from below. So what are the commutation relations that we should choose on these uh, B operators? So let's do a quick uh, poll there. So should we choose bosonic or fermionic commutation relations for B and B dagger? I mean, based on this formula, not on what you expect, please. Okay, I could have guessed. Uh, but it come out here. Um, right, so why why is bosonic the correct choice? Because with bosonic commutation relations, if I interchange them, I do not get a minus sign. If these were fermionic, I would interchange them. I would get an additional minus sign in front of the number operator. And that would be bad because then every additional quantum would contribute a minus a negative energy to the energy total. Okay, um, so let's write this down and then take a break. Commutation relations. Um, they should be uh, bosonic for uh, for B. So meaning that commutator or B and B dagger, let's say for B, P and B, P dagger prime, um, is that's find the standard uh, bosonic commutation relations. Why? Well, then I can interchange these at the expense of, you know, the, the one and get a B dagger B. Uh, so let's write this A dagger B. Okay, again, I'll make sure to put the vector signs on top. Plus, plus one. Um, this is really the number operator of the particles associated to A. So let's denote that by NP and then superscript a plus and this NP superscript minus. And we'll see later why we use this notation. Um, okay, and that's so why did we choose this? Well, because fermionic anti-commutation relations would lead to uh, H uh, not on no, H unbounded below. Okay, so not H, but the uh, the eigenvalues. Let's say energies. Which we don't want. 
Okay, let's do a break here. Start at half past again. Yeah, so just to be entirely sure that we're on the same page uh, when it comes to you know replacing uh, minus p by p. So I've written down just what I said uh, in words, right? For this particular example, but it's uh, it's the same for you know, the, the relabeling that we used up here. Um, so we split the sum into two sums, um, and then you perform a relabeling on the second sum. So we set p equal to minus p prime. So then this turns into a sum over p prime in the same domain because it's uh, invariant on the reflection, the, the integers, uh, the rescaled integers. So then I have an e of minus p a prime, a b p prime, and a b dagger p prime. Then I simply change the label from p prime to p, right? So I get e of minus p, b, p, b, p prime. Um, we notice that e of minus p is the same as e of p. So we can now combine this term, get that term back into the one uh, where we just have plus p's. Okay. Anyway, um, so the, here are the requirement of having um, energy bounded from below, so proper kind of positive energy contribution for every addition of a quantum, um, has led us to choose bosonic uh, relations for the B operators. So where does it leave us for the A operators? Now, certainly we would expect them also to satisfy then bosonic commutation relations. But let's actually give a different type of requirement that you know, makes this choice very rigid. And this is the following requirement. So let's take x and x prime to be two uh, spatial coordinates um, that do not coincide. So if x is a different spatial coordinate from x prime, then what happens if we look at the commutators of the field operators at these points. So x t with say phi x prime time t or right, commutator of phi hat phi hat dagger um, so we, what we want is that these commutators actually vanish. So let's do a, a quick poll. Why do we want these commutators to vanish? Is it to ensure bosonic statistics? Is it to ensure that the energy is bounded below? Or is it to ensure a locality? So we're examining the field um, at two different uh, points in, in space, but at the same time. And then asking whether the order of the operator match, uh, matters or not. We're requiring that the order does not matter. Okay, let's uh, see. Okay, so there is a slight majority for the uh, ensuring uh, locality uh, answer here. Um, and uh, I think I agree. So why is this necessary to ensure locality? Um, well, what would it mean for two observers to be measuring something uh, on a Klein-Gordon field, so a field of particles uh, in our universe? Um, well, when, in order to measure uh, a particle, one has to introduce an interaction. 
and that interaction term, it will include one of these uh, phi hats or phi hat dagger in it, um, in, in, in the operator. So your experiment will correspond to some kind of uh, operator in your quantum mechanical system that um, you will use to do a measurement and get one of its uh, eigenvalues as the outcome of the measurement, right? Um, and you know very well from, from quantum mechanics what you know, a commutator between two different uh, quantum mechanical observables tells you about uh, the statistical outcome of measurements. Uh, if these two commutate, if, if the these two observables commute with each other, then you know that the, the outcome of one experiment cannot affect the outcome of another. Um, but if those observables do commute with each other, then for instance, you know that there is some uncertainty relation between the two measurements. So by doing many, many measurements, you at position X and your, your friend at the same time at a very distant location x prime, then by doing many of the measurement, you could actually you know, get some information about what is happening uh, at, at your friend's place. Now, if, you, if the distance is far here, then this would amount to uh, communication uh, with uh, speeds uh, faster than the speed of light, which we like to prohibit in relativity. Um, if we ensure that the commutators of these fields that appear in our observables actually vanishes, then we know that we cannot use this field to transmit information. So that's why we want these commutators to vanish. And this, in fact, immediately tells us uh, what the commutation relation should be for the A operators. So why is that? So if I just plug in our expansion for phi in say the, the commutator of phi with phi dagger, then we get this double sum for p and p prime. Um, okay, some prefactors, which is not really important. So we have the Fourier coefficient at x and Fourier coefficient in x prime with some normalization. But importantly, we get the commutator of a p of t with commutator of p, the prime version of these with a dagger. So the dagger shifts from the b to the a minus p prime t this and okay so uh, yeah. okay we, we already know what the commutator of b dagger with b is we've chosen that to be uh, the, the bosonic commutation relations so this is minus delta p p prime So if we want this to vanish for every choice of x and x prime, then better the commutator of a with a dagger cancels this contribution. Well, and let's assume that a and b have vanishing commutators. So this goes back to an earlier question. Um, if we assume that, then we know that commutator of a with a dagger has to be well, minus this, so delta p prime. So we conclude that to ensure this locality, so locality ensures the, the bosonic commutation relations for A as well. So A P A P prime. Uh, sorry, with a dagger, of course. And okay, maybe I want to put here the, the unit operator. 
Okay, so now we've got our, our Fox space. We know we have two sets uh, of, uh, of uh, annihilation and creation operators, which have their own corresponding number operators. Um, so specifying the numbers for all different um, uh, momentum, uh, discrete momentum states, specifies a basis for a Fox space. And we know how our field operator acts on this Fox space. So now we can go ahead and read off, according to our menu, what is the particle interpretation. Um, and we did this for the, uh, the electromagnetic field by looking at how the, the, the uh, macroscopic quantities are expressed in terms of the number operators. So we've already seen uh, above that the Hamiltonian is of this form. Now without proof, let me mention that the total uh, momentum in the field can be derived to be of the form like this. Finally, let's look at the total charge in the field. So what does the total charge look like? Um, well, if you think of this field as being, you know, every particle described by the field, it has uh, some, some charge associated to it. So somehow the charge distribution should be associated to some density. But we already know what the density should look like for the Klein-Gordon uh, equation, because we, we've encountered this in the first lecture. So what did this look like? The, the density um, of the Klein-Gordon field, it was this combination of phi, time derivative of phi, uh, minus time derivative of phi. Oh, sorry, I put it that. Uh, complex conjugate or a dagger. So this this was pretty much our attempt at writing down the uh, probability density associated to the one particle uh, wave function interpretation. Because we knew that this satisfied a continuity equation. But now really we want to interpret this in the quantum setting. Let's put some hats on there as not a probability density, but a charge density. So we take this quantity here and we integrate it over space, over the box. If this were a wave function, we would think of this as the, the total probability. So this should be normalized equal to one, but okay, we figured out that we cannot give it such an interpretation. Now, okay, let's properly normalize it. This is going to be our charge operator. So we call that this was well, up to uh, normalization, exactly the, the density from KG continuity equation. Now, if I substitute my field um, operator in there, what I get is, okay, I won't have time to, to, to really do the calculation, but it's again uh, the same uh, type of manipulation where you make sure that the, the Fourier modes are orthogonal with respect to each other. And what we get is, again, an expression in terms of the number operators. So that is saying that this is a one particle additive operator. But what we find, importantly, is that there is a minus sign in front of the particles that come with the B operators. Um, and then we get a minus one. So where did this minus one come from? Well, exactly again from the commutation relations that we have to use to turn the, uh, the B, B dagger in a B dagger B.
Okay. Um, so what does this mean? Well, we can now read off exactly what the particles are that are created and annihilated uh, by these operators. So let's just do this. So the A operators, they create or annihilate a particle in our Fox space. And we already know that this is supposed to be a spin zero boson with momentum. This will read off from our total momentum operator, every quantum adds a P, so it should have momentum P. Energy, we read off from this expression, so every quantum adds an EP, which luckily is really positive. And a charge, which we read off from the total charge, well, every of these adds a plus Q. Okay, a quick poll. So what changes if I replace A by B based on what we've seen now? Yes, indeed. The only place in these operators where the contribution of the, the pluses and the minus differs is in the total charge. So, update our conclusion for the Bs. Um, so, okay, we call this the antiparticle. Now, um, it has momentum P, energy E, charge minus Q. Clear? So we've worked through the uh, the whole list. We've deduced the particle interpretation. We have the Fox space. Oh, Klein Gordon is uh, done. So in the remaining time, we're going to go through the same list, but now for the Dirac field, and we'll see if there are some slight differences there. So for the Dirac field, what was that again? Um, we had four complex components per space-time point. These are assumed to satisfy the Dirac equation. Let's uh, not put an uh, electromagnetic potential there, so just a free uh, Dirac field. Um, which we can also write in the non-covariant uh, form using the alpha and, and beta matrices like this. So what is the Hamiltonian here? So the Hamiltonian is given by following expression, which again, I'm not going to entirely derive, but it should also not come exactly as a surprise. So 
so so what are we writing here so this is the well just the spatial you know, hamiltonian that we had in the the one particle interpretation acting on psi and then taking squashing it with psi a dagger integrating over over space so really if we would like to interpret this quantity in the one particle quantum mechanics this would essentially be the, the one particle hamiltonian acting on the wave function um, and then taking its uh, it's inner product with psi, so really the expectation value of the Hamiltonian on this wave function. Now, okay, you can also now forget about this because we're not going to interpret psi as a wave function. It's just a classical field for now, classical Dirac field. Again, you can check that the time derivative of this uh, quantity is automatically zero if the Dirac equation is satisfied. So it's certainly a constant of motion. So we have to do the plane wave expansion. So what did, this, did these again look like? Um, so we've derived them several weeks ago. So for each spatial momentum P, we found the four solutions or four base basis solutions spanning the, the four uh, components that the direct spinner has. Um, and we identified these as um, positive and negative energy and positive and negative uh, helicity. So let's write them down explicitly in a convenient way. So what did these solutions look like? Well, we had a you know, the standard you know, uh, uh, phase that you also have for the solutions of the Klein-Gordon equation, p dot x over h bar, where now it's useful to introduce <coughs> this p plus minus notation. So what is uh, p plus minus? So it's the four vector uh, where I take a, a positive or a negative um, zero F component for a given spatial momentum P. Um, and then but there is a four, a four vector, no, not another four vector, a four component um, uh, thing U that has to solve um, some eigenvalue equations. And what are the eigenvalues equations in order for it to have you know, correct positive or negative energy? It should be an eigenvalue of this matrix. This we found. Um, so the plus or minus here, it really labels a positive or negative energy of this plane wave. And what is the lambda? So the lambda should label the helicity, the two possible values of the helicity. So what does that mean in terms of uh, matrices or operators? Well, it means that if I take the spin operator in our product with the momentum operator on this u plus minus lambda, that it should give you a, an eigenvalue lambda. Multiplying you know, the, the, absolute, the absolute value of P. Right, the helicity that was really the spin in the direction of motion. So if I would divide this equation by the, the length of P, then this eigenvalue is exactly lambda h bar. So that means that lambda is minus one half or one half. So this gives a complete basis uh, of solutions. And as soon as we have that, we can write down the plane wave expansion just like before. So now we have 
again sum over the momenta so we're in a box so this should still be 2 pi over l h bar times integers now we also have a sum over the two helicities we have a normalization then we have um, well, a spatial dependence which is just the same Fourier component that we used for the, uh, the Klein-Gordon equation 1 over square root phi e to the not, uh, sorry. and then we should incorporate both the the positive energy and negative energy part. So for, let's first do the positive energy, u plus lambda. So that, that gives us the four uh, components. And then the time dependence, we put it in this a p of t. So what is this? So this is, as before, a p lambda. And then we have the, the negative uh, energy factor, which now comes with the negative frequency part C. Okay. So really the only different thing here compared to the Klein-Gordon case is these, well, the, the, the spin factors that stand in front and what well, the summation over the, 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 the spin degrees of freedom here parameterized by the helicities. We can substitute this in here and again we get something very similar ah uh, let me not put hats yet Let, let's do the uh, sorry i'm skipping ahead we want, still want to identify harmonic oscillators um, right, so this is exactly the expression I, I wrote down for the Klein-Gordon equation. Uh, but, but this is actually correct. Uh, or or would this be a bit too simple? Looking back at the um, particular uh, Hamiltonian that we have uh, above here, uh, is it similar to the one for the, the Klein-Gordon equation or has it a uh, marked difference? And then let's have a look again at the uh, Klein-Gordon equation. This one. Um, so, so what we can see from this this classical expression is that each of these individual terms they are just manifestly positive, right? But if we look at this Hamiltonian for the Dirac field, well, it only has these first derivatives in here. So in no way did this thing is uh, ensured to be uh, to be positive. And also, 
since it is exactly the expectation value of a Hamiltonian on a state in the one particle quantum mechanics, but we already know that that does not need to be positive. Because we found explicitly states psi that were eigenstates with negative energy eigenvalues. So we started with a Hamiltonian which, is, which isn't bounded below. It can take negative values. So this can never be the correct expression, right? Because this is manifestly positive. In fact, if you plug this in there, the only difference you get with the Klein-Gordon equation that there is really a minus sign. So this is really a consequence of what the orthogonality relations of these, um, um, these helicity vectors, if you like. So this is kind of prime, the prime location where things start to differ from both the Klein-Gordon and the electromagnetic field. So this thing is clearly unbounded below. Just like in, in the, the one particle quantum mechanics interpretation. Um, so what does that mean for these uh, harmonic oscillators? Well, it means that this is not a infinite collection of simple harmonic oscillators. If it, it, if it would be, then, then the Hamiltonian would be bounded below. Or if you like these, the components of C, they combine into like an inverted uh, oscillator with the wrong signs in front of the, the kinetic and potential term. So not such simple harmonic oscillators in the usual sense. So that means that we have to do something different in the quantization. So let's see what we can do different. I'm going to cheat a bit and copy something. Um, so the only thing that differs here is that now these things uh, depend on the helicity as well. So no need to change uh, anything here yet. Um, Let's write down the, the field operator. Where now we substitute in the, uh, the Fourier components as we did for the Klein-Gordon operator. And again, implicit, implicitly here, I'm changing from P to minus P. To get an expression which is really similar to the one for the Klein-Gordon operator. If you substitute this, into the, uh, the Hamilton operator that you get from well, simply this expression by putting hats on psi and psi dagger, then what we get is okay. 
and not really uh, unexpectedly, since it should be a quantization of this thing, P lambda We again see this minus sign appearing. Um, so what is the thing that we can do different here? Well, we want this Hamiltonian to be bounded below in the quantum setting. That's clear what to do. To get the number operator, we have to interchange the order of these two, but now we do want the minus sign. So now we should choose fermionic anti-commutation. relations. So B anti-commutator with B dagger given in the usual way. Because then if I do this turns into similar expression as for the Klein-Gordon. Where again the plus version is the one corresponding to the A's and the minus version the one corresponding to the B's. Now it's interesting to note that in fact here I get the zero point energy with a minus sign. Whereas for Klein Gordon, where are we? Here, we got a plus sign for the zero point energy. But apart from that, well, this Hamiltonian operator looks identical. But now for fermionic. Um, commutation with anti-commutation relations. And similarly, I'm not going to discuss this, locality can then be used to show that A should satisfy the same. A and A dagger similar. Okay. Then, finally, since we're running out of time, I'm going to upset you by doing a copy. We can read off the particle interpretation. Um, so this time, let's see. Uh, here also the sign changes on the. Oh, what, what is this really? This uh, this plus one. So this is like a a zero point charge or a vacuum charge. which, again, we would like to forget about because it is uh, constantly um, spread out over whole of space, so you should not notice it, or preferably we should choose our operators in such a way that it's exactly cancelled or renormalized away. Um, so the particles, they are now uh, spin one-half fermions, based on the commutation relations, and we create momentum P, energy E, positive charge Q, and in this case, since we also have labels for the helicity, they have helicity lambda, and the other ones 
what is this? There's nothing here. <clears throat> they create the, the similar antiparticles with helicity lambda. Right, you agree this is uh, entirely analogous to the particle interpretation that we did for the Klein Gordon equation. Sorry. <clears throat> So to wrap things up, in the last few minutes, let, let's draw some conclusions. So the first thing we can conclude here is that we can actually derive the fact that the particular field is fermionic or bosonic. And apparently this depends on the spin. Now this is something that we, we've heard before, but until now it was always an assumption. But now we could actually conclude it based on the requirements that we have imposed on our theory being uh, well, satisfying the relativistic principle. So this is called the spin statistics theorem. And of course, we have not seen it in its full uh, generality, um, only for these uh, particular examples of fields. But you can extend these, these arguments that I've given about the boundedness of energy and the locality to show that in relativistic, many particle quantum mechanics, We really have that integer spin fields should be quantized with bosonic statistics, while half integers fields, spin fields, should be quantized with fermionic statistics. So that is a really nice consequence of, of uh, using relativity here, because it's clearly very important already in a non-relativistic setting, but there, there was no a priori reason why these should be paired up in this particular way. You can easily imagine a fermionic spin zero particle um, in, in a non-relativistic setting, except that they just do not exist in nature. You can imagine um, bosonic uh, uh, half integer spin non-relativistic uh, particle, but they just do not exist, except in well, uh, condensed matter systems, perhaps. But not fundamentally. Um, and now we understand why this is, because if it's a fundamental particle, then fundamentally it should satisfy the relativistic principle. And there, we must obey this theorem. Um, so the other thing is, so particles and antiparticles, so protons, I mean, um, electrons and positrons, they have to be described like in, in, a, in a joint fashion in your quantum field theory. They can't live or be described without each other in a consistent fashion. So particles and antiparticles are described jointly in, uh, in the uh, field uh, operators uh, formulation of uh, the relativistic quantum mechanics. And finally, this is uh, maybe a nice uh, outlook if you encounter this later. I remarked that the zero point uh, energies that you find and also the these infinite background charges, they have opposite signs for fermions and bosons. So 
So what would be a very simple way to not have to uh, bother about these, uh, these background uh, zero point energies if I would have an equal number of uh, bosons and fermions with equal zero point energies but opposite sign, they would exactly cancel each other. And this is actually one of the motivations for considering supersymmetry. So what is supersymmetry? So it postulates an additional fundamental symmetry satisfied by the quantum field theories for the particles in our universe, uh, which is a symmetry between a particle that is a boson and uh, a cousin particle that is a fermion. And it ensures, or predicts if you like, an equal number of them. So that would imply that these actually cancel exactly. Now, mind you, um, supersymmetry has not been uh, encountered in particle accelerators, uh, even though people have looked for it for many decades now. Um, so, we like supersymmetry mainly because it has some appealing uh, consequences, but the reality is uh, very unclear. Okay, this uh, wraps up the relativistic quantum mechanics business. Are there any questions? <laughs>